Okay, we are about to start our program for tonight, another GCAS live free public lecture. And this lecture is actually unique in the sense that it's kind of an introductory lecture. And um, I'm happy to introduce our guests now. And let me do that. And good. So we have with us uh, two well known philosophers and logicians. Uh, the first guest is a distinguished research fellow at the Global Center for Advanced Studies, GCAS, Rocco or Rocky Gangle. Uh, Rocky Gangle is a, a full professor of philosophy at Endicott College, and he is the author of several books, including Francois Laurel, Philosophies of Difference, A Critical Introduction and Guide, and Diagrammatic Eminence, Category Theory and Philosophy, he also has co-edited or co-authored several books, including uh, The Iconicity and Abduction, uh, which was published in 2017, and co-edited Superpositions, uh, Superpositions, right? Yeah, Laurel and the Humanities. Uh, that came out also in 2017. Um, Rocco Gangel uh, specializes in a, a number of different fields, but all of which are connected to logic, inspired by Spinoza, somewhat of Deleuze, uh, and he works in semiotics, diagrammatic logic, obviously coming from the title of his book, Metaphysics and Political Philosophy. Our next guest is coming all the way from the Global South uh, in Argentina, uh, Fernando Tomé. Uh, Fernando Tomé uh, uh, is a principal researcher at the National Research Council of Argentina and is full professor in the Department of Economics at the Universidad Nacional de Sur, de Sur in Argentina. Uh, he holds uh, several degrees and has actually uh, served as a Fulbright scholar, uh, serving and teaching in different positions in the United States, including UC Berkeley, Washington University in St. Louis, and Endicott College. So we're really pleased to have both of you, and I understand both of you are also good mates. Is that right? You're working on different projects. That's right. Great. So go, go ahead, whomever. So yeah, take over. All right, great. Welcome, everyone. Um, glad to have you here. Uh, so Fernando and I are going to kind of carve up the, the talk today. I'll, I'll start uh, and kind of cover the first half, and then um, uh, he'll cover the second half. Um, the theme of today's talk is uh, the work of Nicolas Luhmann, but particularly the theoretical framework he uses of systems theory. Uh, and this is a kind of uh, introduction to the topics that we'll be covering in our seminar together next month through GCAS. Uh, and the talk is uh, uh, divided into to three parts, um, just to quickly um, canvas the, the life and uh, work of Luhmann, um, and then set up the discussion of his uh, theoretical framework of autopoietic uh, systems by tracing a kind of genealogy of four main theoretical frameworks that have characterized uh, the development of the, um, uh, the West, uh, and trying to think about the role of second order cybernetics or uh, autopoietic modes of cybernetics in, in the framework of today's uh, culture. So uh, Luhmann himself uh, was born in the, the 1920s in Germany, uh, and he actually served in World War II as a very young um, conscripted soldier. He was, uh, he was uh, either 16 or 17 when he was actually captured at the front uh, near the end of the war. Um, and uh, spent some time as a, as a prisoner of war in France. Uh, and that experience led him to, to reflect on uh, the conditions of justice, and um, in particular, the, the kind of international framework of the Geneva Conventions. He became a law student at Freiburg University um, and then served uh, a number of posts in the German civil service uh, in the, uh, the 1950s. Um, and up then uh, as a, a student, uh, getting a research fellowship to study with Talcott Parsons, the, the well-known sociologist at Harvard uh, in 1961-62. Um, and that's where he was 
introduced to the notion of functionalism as a method in sociology. Uh, he was captivated by the approach pioneered by Parsons. Uh, and when he came back to Germany, uh, he pursued a degree in sociology. Uh, he got his PhD, uh, I think in the, around 1966 um, and got a job at the University of Bielefeld where he's for his entire career. So he was there uh, for 24, 25 years um, as professor of sociology. He became professor emeritus in 93, uh, continued to write up until his death uh, in 1998. Um, and I guess the one other piece of biography that's uh, interesting is that in the 1970s, he was relatively well known in Germany for a series of debates that he had with the German critical theorist, Jürgen Habermas. And this is a nice way to kind of position Luhmann is as a, an interlocutor with Habermas and with a very different approach to the problem of communication and communicative rationality. Um, his writings um, pretty naturally break into three chunks. Uh, his early works, uh, he later, uh, uh, saw as sort of pre-theoretical. He didn't disavow them, but he considered them not particularly important, not innovative. Um, but notable among these, these early works were studies of trust and power. Um, and both of these already apply the, the functionalist approach of sociology, but not within the context of kind of full-blown second order cybernetics, which becomes his main framework. That framework he consolidates in his major work, Social Systems in 1984. This is really the turning point for him. This is as kind of, um, some people consider it his magnum opus that, that uh, verifies a theory of social systems. Uh, and then his work for the next decade um, or more consisted of applying that theory of social systems to various sectors of society economy, science, law, art, media, love, religion. And each one of these books basically takes a particular aspect of society, uh, analyzes it through the concept of autopoiesis. Um, and, um, and each of these books runs, you know, sometimes 400 pages. So he's he really producing an enormous output during his career. And then his final um, sort of masterwork is a two volume uh, theory of society that he completed just before his death and was translated into English um, not too long ago. Both volumes are now available. Um, so we're concerned with the theoretical framework rather than the particular applications. Um, and I think Luhmann's uh, idea of theory is quite traditional here. He presumes that the theoretical object of any science is constructed according to the framework that determines that science. So you can think of this as a kind of application of prerogative logic, that the world, nature, society, whatever phenomena we are asking about scientifically gives us answers according to the kinds of questions that we pose to it. So if we pose questions in the form of mathematical law, those are the kinds of responses we'll give. If we pose questions in terms of a priori um, ideas, those will be the kinds of answers we receive. Um, now, of course, the object of sociology is society, and this is a problematic term. Do, can, can we identify this object? Uh, do I identify it empirically, a priori way? Um, and what Luhmann wants to do is note a kind of opportunity that is given to him in the context of late 20th century Western culture. He believes that this particular society, which you can consider a late modern or postmodern society as you, as you wish, this form of society has produced within itself two theoretical frameworks. And in particular, the new theoretical framework, second order cybernetics that can renew the science of society. So this is the kind of question that he will pose in order to receive the answers that are developed for his theory. So to get to that, clarification of what he means by order cybernetics, we can tell a kind of genealogical story of uh, several different models that have characterized theoretical questions in the West. And this is not Luhmann's own um, presentation, but it's drawn from his, um, his kind of genealogical work. I think that he would agree that there's 
uh, this is more or less faithful to his way of thinking about the development of, of Western culture and Western science. So we'll look at just four models based on four diagrams here. Um, and each one corresponds to a kind of question that we can pose to what phenomenon is it at issue. Um, hey, so we can ask, what is mind, this? Rocky, would you mind just cutting your video because uh, it'll help with the audio, thanks. Sure, absolutely. Um, so we, we can ask the question, uh, what is it? What is X? Um, and the traditional way that we would conceive of this kind of question and the kind of answer that it gives us um, would be a kind of asceticism uh, that we ask for the us, the idea or form of a thing. Um, and we try to establish the essential characteristics that make that thing is. And of course, the, the paradigm of this way of um, questioning the world would come out of Plato, uh, but it also characterizes um, uh, some of the streams of um, contemporary philosophy. This is the, the very essence of Husserl's project of phenomenology, very influential for Luhmann. Um, but we can also pose the question, not what is X, but how does X work? And this would be a kind of paradigm of mechanism. Uh, and we can already see this way of questioning the world develop uh, in Plato's immediate successor, Aristotle, uh, by posing um, four modes of cause, uh, material, formal, efficient, and final, only one of which, the formal cause, really corresponds to um, the Platonic eidos. Um, and one way that we can trace a genealogy, say from Aristotle to Galileo and then post-Galileo science would be to think of the increasing importance um, and finally the um, kind of single focus of efficient cause. Um, and this would be, I think, the kind of end point of mechanism. And the, the diagram here is meant to suggest that our X has become an object that is composed of parts which are linked to one another by way of various causal relations. And then we can think of the, uh, the, the object X as basically being a kind of machine, parts organized in some fashion such that their, uh, their inner relations um, can be uh, linked to various inputs, various outside external causes, and then lead to various uh, outputs, various actions or effects. Um, so this sort of mechanical model has the same approach both to the outside, the environment of X, and to X itself. X is a machine and the world at large, the environment functions in a machine-like way. Everything is kind of structured by causality. Uh, and when we move to the, the next, notice that what we've done essentially is removed that internal structure. So we can pose a question, what does X do? And think of this as the paradigm of functionalism. Um, and in this step from mechanism to formalism, uh, which corresponds to uh, the philosophical position of pragmatism in a certain sense, uh, to functionalism and also to first order cybernetics, um, we no longer ask how is put together internally, we only look at X, our object of inquiry, in terms of its inputs and its outputs. And so I've pictured this in a very um, simplistic way. We have multiple inputs, multiple arrows coming in from the left, multiple potential outputs on the right. Um, and we can think of X as a kind of black box. We don't know what's inside it, all we have is the kind of experimental approach whereby feeding different inputs into X generates different outputs and we can try to anticipate what X is going to do, how it is going to function on the basis of past performance. Um, and although the model here appears very, very simple, it's important to emphasize that this can uh, develop in very, very complicated ways. In particular, we can have the output of X also serve as inputs. And then we have a feedback mechanism um, and we can wire 
various objects together so that the inputs of one are the outputs of another um, and, and produce very, very complicated um, functional apparatuses that have various kinds of internal feedback. Um, and so this can, can develop uh, as, a, as a, a relatively complex way of thinking about biological phenomena, um, uh, robots, computers, um, and various kinds of, uh, of machines. But it's this next step that represents what's important for Lumon, which is to pose the question, not how does X function, but how does X make itself? How does X make or produce X? This is the model of autopoiesis. And I've tried to picture it here as a, um, uh, a box, right? A kind of black box, but it's a box in which the term X appears twice. X labels box, it is the thing itself, but it also has a kind of internal model of itself. And the core idea of autopoiesis, uh, as Luhmann takes it over from thinkers like um, Heinz von Forster and um, uh, George Spencer Brown, um, is that there is a distinction between system and environment that characterizes the system itself. And what is particularly interesting about this structure is that you have a kind of internal model of the system within the system. The system is its own modeling of its own difference from the environment, which is its own environment. And so I've tried to capture that in the diagram here. You can see that there is a relationship between X, this question mark on the right, we can call this the, the, the actual or the real environment. There are cause and effect relationships, perturbations going in both directions, but then there is the system environment distinction itself, which appears inside X. Inside the system, the system environment distinction is modeled. Uh, and then the arrow from X itself means that X exists as producing or making itself through a set of closed operations whereby X only operates on its own production of the system environment difference. By way of operating on itself, it is able to then be open to the environment. So what does this mean for sociological theory? Well, if we pose the question, our object of inquiry, how does this object produce itself? How, in what sense is it poetic? On the one hand, we necessarily shift from what Heinz von Forster calls trivial to non-trivial systems. And a trivial system does not necessarily mean a simple system. It doesn't have to be uh, easy or uncomplicated. A system is trivial if, in principle, it predicted. So you might have a very, very complicated system with that? all kinds of feedback mechanisms, yes? Can you just repeat what you said? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, so in, in the shift from trivial to non-trivial systems, a trivial system does not need to be a simple system. Um, a system can be very, very complicated. What makes it trivial in von Forster's sense is that it is in principle predictable. And you can think here of, of a very, very complicated computer program. Um, an algorithm might have you know, a very, very elaborate structure, but in principle, it is going step by step and doing the same thing in a deterministic way even if there's some sort of feedback mechanism or recursion involved. Because a second order system defines itself as its own distinction from the environment, in principle, unpredictable. It, it generates its own unpredictability as its way of interacting with the environment. The system itself doesn't know what it will do next. And so um, it's, it's not just difficult to predict, but it's unpredictable in principle because it creates itself on the basis of contingency. Um, very closely related to this shift is that no longer is the system and the environment um, a system or a, a constitution that is tightly coupled. In other words, there isn't a direct causal connection or input-output relation 
between system and environment, the system by operating on itself is, always, is only loosely coupled to the environment. In other words, it can perform autonomous operations that don't directly interact with the environment. And a very nice model of this would be to think about the human mind, that we're able to think about things in a purely internal way if nothing is happening, uh, even if we're not acting on the world and the world might not be doing anything to us that is unusual, we thinking about things and actually generating very, very complicated projects and so forth. Um, and finally, um, this approach of autopoiesis, at least as Luhmann understands it, puts paradox at the center of the object of theory. Paradox is not just a um, way of thinking of the object, but it actually is constitutive of the object. The object is its own impossibility of knowing its own distinction. Um, and in this way, there's a, a, a connection between Luhmann and Derridian deconstruction. And Luhmann himself has um, commented on that in a number of places that he, he sees his approach to autopoiesis as a kind of rigorous mode of Derrida's critique of presence. Um, one final thing that this means is that anytime we would apply this kind of theory to a, a domain, we have to choose some basic or fundamental distinction that define that system environment difference. The system environment difference has to be a simple binary in some sense. So we can look at biological systems with the basic distinction being life. We can look at uh, mental or psychic systems where the basic distinction is meaning or experience. Um, and Luhmann's entire theory of social systems chooses or decides communication as the term, the distinction that is the basis for the autopoiesis of social systems. Um, and it's out of this uh, choice of communication that then the entire theory of society develops. So I'll turn things over here to, uh, to Fernando. Thanks, Robbie. <clears throat> Can you show the next slide? Yeah. Um, in this part of the talk, we 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 want to right, Fernando. Uh, I'm sorry. There's yeah. a question. There's a question for Rocky from yeah. Jason Ross, and Jason Ross asks, "Would you be or do you want to handle questions last?" I'm so sorry to interrupt. Why don't we let's save the questions till the end, just okay. for the Perfect. sake of of clarity. Yep. Okay. Cheers. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So um, in this part of the talk, we want to. Uh, connect the, this theoretical framework to, in which Luhmann worked with the zeitgeist in technological scientific uh, issues. Uh, and this is important because we have to justify our approach of how to represent formally, logically, uh, Luhmann's work. So the, 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 the main point is that uh, we cannot understand Luhmann without seeing him embedded in the, in the, in the cybernetic era. Uh, he draw so many ideas from cybernetics that uh, the connection deserves to be analyzed a little bit more. Um, the field of cybernetics was uh, born after World War II uh, and was named by the mathematician Norbert Wiener. Uh, Wiener was a world expert in stochastic processes, that, uh, that is processes in which uh, random shocks play a fundamental role in, in their evolution. Uh, and he worked in the world e war effort uh, trying to understand this crucial problem for the defense of cities like London. Um, you have the, uh, uh, the, the uh, anti-aircraft -air, uh, uh, guns trying to shoot down the bomber planes. Uh, the, the question is that gunners usually uh, shoot, shoot to aim to their shoots to, to positions that when the bullet reached the height of the planes, the plane was already uh, ahead of that position. So it was necessary to include in the system 
in, in ar around the gunners, the possibility of predicting the future uh, position of the planes and aiming to that position and not the current one. And this was a problem that uh, Wiener saw in a larger pr perspective as a problem of uh, using information from the observable phenomenon to bring that back into the system and correct its uh, probably uh, probable mistakes. And that's why he used the word cybernetics for this field of study, because it comes from the ancient Greek, uh, a word in the ancient Greek meaning governance or healthmanship. And, uh, but uh, the definition Wiener gave of the discipline is as the scientific study of control and communication in the animal and the machine, because he saw a very close relation between many phenomena he saw in the natural and the artificial world. So uh, next slide, please, uh, Rocky. The, the, main, the main commonality he found was the presence of negative feedbacks. Negative feedback is, the, is uh, this process in which you have a system given an output, but that output makes a mistake with respect to the aims of the system. So the difference, this error factor is uh, fed in back in the system. So to correct potential future errors. And so uh, 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 a system with negative feedbacks has an internal stabilizing, stabilizing force that brings it back to normal behavior. And so negative feedbacks contribute to preserving the system from falling apart. And that's true in, in, in living uh, beings, in ecosystems, in societies, and in, in technological uh, devices. So the, 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 this, the, this presence of negative feedbacks led Wiener to think that this should be better understood and given a mathematical framework to analyze it. Next, next slide, please, Rocky. One of the interesting cybernetic uh, developments of the 40s, uh, because Wiener's idea took over uh, the, 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 the work of many mathematicians, physicists, uh, neuroscientists from that era. And so uh, a lot of people became engaged in this and trying to create systems that could replicate the behavior of other systems to uh, understand them better. And uh, one of these developments was the creation of artificial neural networks by Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts. Um, the idea was, of course, trying to understand how the brain works, uh, but now taking into account that Actually, we can model the brain also as carrying out, carrying out some kind of a process in which new, uh, negative feedbacks are relevant. The question was how to train a neural network to do something interesting. And there was the importance of feedbacks that uh, corrected mistakes made by, by the neural network. And uh, at the time, there was a great enthusiasm in the idea that this could lead to uh, artificially intelligent beings, like uh, what they called artificial brains. But it lost steam around the end of the 50s and beginning of the 60s because the development of 
computer, digital computers, led many experts to think that actually what was needed to gain artificial intelligence was explicitly given the system the knowledge it needs. So it, you need to explicitly say how to reason and give it the knowledge to reason with, with, uh, with those rules. And uh, there was nothing like a new, uh, negative feedback needed for the system to work correctly. And uh, this, this is called the symbolic approach to artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, it dominated the, 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 the view of how artificial intelligence had to be developed for three decades or so. Next, next slide, please. In the meanwhile, there was a, happening something interesting. In, in, the, in the late 40s, the creation of, um, of cybernetics in the West uh, was seen very negatively by, by, by the Soviets, in particular by, by, by Stalin. Uh, they claimed that actually it was a tool of dominance of the capitalists to replace human workers by machines and uh, that uh, uh, they had to to fight that. And for many, for a decade or so, uh, it was kind of forbidden to talk about cybernetics other than to uh, make uh, negative comments on it. But after the, the death of, uh, of Stalin, uh, it became very popular in the, in the Soviet Union. Actually, they, they saw it as a tool that could be used for their um, five-year plans uh, to control the economy automatically to see what, uh, when some uh, goods are uh, missing, uh, are needed in some part of the country. And so the, the system could uh, actually find where they could be found to be provided there, et cetera, et cetera. This never worked really because there were a lot of factors that we already know about why the, 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 the Soviet Union fell in the, in the, at the end of the 90s, uh, of the 80s. But the important thing is that a lot of um, uh, Eastern Bloc mathematicians worked on this problem and tried to provide a new mathematical framework better than uh, that of um, stochastic processes. Interesting developments were done by uh, Czech mathematicians. And uh, as an aside, let me tell, remind you that robot is a, is a word from Czech, from from the Czech language. Uh, so it seems that it's a culture that has been interested in this for a long time. But um, this is just a, a digression. Uh, com coming back to this, those Czech mathematicians used category theory to, to mathematically uh, frame uh, cybernetics and in general system science. So this is interesting, and, and we will refer to this a lot during our, our seminar uh, next month. Next, next uh, slide, please. But in the West was happening something very interesting. By the 90s, by, by the 90s was clear that the symbolic approach to 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 uh, artificial intelligence didn't work. It required so much uh, writing, so much knowledge uh, explicitly written down in programs that it was no longer feasible. Instead, neural networks 
with many, many layers. That's why they call, are called deep neural networks became feasible. While, while in the 50s, it was very costly to, to build up a very small neural network. Now it was possible to make large neural networks. And uh, in time, they were even larger and even better adjusted. And uh, the negative uh, feedback that was the, in the origin of McCulloch and Pitt's uh, approach, now it gave rise to very sophisticated algorithms, uh, one called backpropagation, uh, which are very important for the training of these networks. And so now when everybody talks about artificial intelligence, they mean some kind of neural, a deep neural network uh, applied to learn some ability and implement it. Even for instance, uh, autonomous cars or uh, systems like those home assistants that you think you are talking to a human being, but actually they are trained neural networks. Next, uh, next slide, please. But this is this has has an impact on on other disciplines. For instance, uh, on neuroscience, there is this very interesting program very popular by the British neuros, neural, uh, neuroscientist Carl Friston, which is the idea that the brain is carrying out a process of active inference, meaning that actually the brain facing the external world has two possibilities. One is to adapt itself to that world or in, act on the world to prepare, make it more familiar, more friendly to the brain. So this is also an example of cyber, a cybernetic loop acting on, on the brain. And this is, has an impact in that goes beyond neuroscience. And uh, there are now uh, many, many scientists trying to apply it to, to, to understand the behavior of ecosystems and even uh, political systems, societies, et cetera, et cetera, many decades after Lumen. Ne next, uh, next slide, please. So, in particular, this uh, this these uh, work in in these works in in the area of brain science uh, has have brought back interest in autopoiesis, the phenomenon that Rocky mentioned before. Uh, it's still in the making a formal mathematical model of autopoiesis, but it's interesting that the um, the mathematician, a very precision, prestigious mathematician, Louis Kaufman, uh, gave a presidential lecture, lecture at the American Society on Cybernetics, redefining the field, saying that it's now, cybernetics is now the study of systems and processes that interact with themselves and produce themselves from themselves. If that's not uh, autopoiesis, I don't know what it is. So actually autopoiesis is the current view of cybernetics. And so the idea of every system that uh, has interacts with itself, with itself actually leads in the more interesting cases to systems that also produce themselves that give rise to themselves by their interaction with the external world, but also bringing back the information gained by that interaction. 
So next slide, which I think is the last one. Yeah. The sad thing is that uh, Luhmann passed away a little right before these issues became so popular again, uh, uh, after a long winter of cybernetics. But now we have a lot of uh, new tools to rewrite what he said in more formal logical terms and uh, in particular, trying to formalize what autopoiesis is. And so our project in, in the seminar is to try to give uh, diagrammatic, because that's the language of category theory, translation of Luhmann's idea. We think that we will be at the end of the seminar, be able to present some of his main ideas in this new light. Rocky, I'm finished. Great, thank you very much sure. for that. And uh, I'm going to post some questions that right. have been proposed. And I'm gonna do that by um, copying and pasting the questions right into uh, the platform here. And here we go. The first one is from Jason Ross. Can you read those? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, well, I, I, sure, I, I, yeah, I'll take that first one. Um, I mean, I, this is, this goes part of Luman's project. The question is, would you be able to give an example of autopoiesis in society. Um, for Luhmann, there are autopoietic systems throughout society, right? The, the, the modern society is a kind of um, immense um, environment of overlapping autopoietic systems, right? And a, a good metaphor here would be to think about the, um, the various subsystems of the body, right? We're made up of over many billions or trillions of cells, but we're also um, composed of various subsystems like the respiratory system, the nervous system, the immune system, each of which is composed of various tissues and functionalities. Um, and the point is that these are not compartmentalized. In other words, it's not as if you can, you can identify the respiratory system as one thing and the circulatory system something else. Each system is its own autopoietic process, but only in its relationship to its environment. Right? So all these various autopoietic systems are in the environment of the other systems. Um, but to an example, one example dear to Luman would be any business organization. But Luman, um, uh, one of his later books is on um, decision and organization. And he thinks of um, organizations and you can think of a business or it could be a nonprofit or a political party, any of these kind of social organizations. Um, according to Harry, he, he, he understands an organization as an autopoietic reproduction of the act of decision. And so this is the, the if you sort of think about the way his theory works in practice, to identify a system is to identify the distinction that it makes that defines what it is. Organization is a system that makes decisions. Um, and for Luhmann, the, the form of distinction um, that characterizes any social system would be communication. So an organization communicates decisions. You and I are communicating right now. Um, but I think the the strange thing, the very, the, the very difficult aspect of Luhmann's project is to recognize that for him, whether he's right about this or not, you and I, when we communicate, are not part of the communicative system. The communicative system is an autonomous, operationally used system of communications. We are in the environment of 
the linguistic system that is functioning right now. So as I speak to you, the linguistic system is an operationally closed, very complex system that is performing its operations with me as an input, right? I am an environmental input a system that is generating and regenerating itself. And, and to give you a sense of very quickly of how that might work, notice when I speak to you, instead of, instead of putting myself as the subject, almost in a Heideggerian way, a kind of s gift, right? It speaks, it unders. So language speaks, but how does it speak? It communicates in such a way that the only thing you can do to that communication is communicate about it. To respond to that communication is to communicate again. So the communication system is autopoetic in the sense that it produces an operation, communication, which tends to produce the conditions whereby that operation will be repeated and thereby instructed. Mm -hmm. I, I, can I give another example that may be yeah. also interesting because of an, another question in, from the audience? Um, <clears throat> consider a sports team. A sports team has a goal, win uh, a tournament or yeah, something, a championship or whatever. And it consists of a group of players that may change during the tournament or the, cha the championship. But it keeps its goal and it changes internally to be better, to achieve better that goal. It's, it's something that can be reconfigured. Say you, you send some players that do not play well to the bench and, and bring other new ones but they all belong to the same team. Uh, that's an autopoietic organization that actually it's recreating itself to reach its goal. But an example of a pathological autopoietical system is for instance, an, uh, an organization that loses sight of what it is doing. doing. For instance, imagine a, a company that it's overreaching, that tries to cover many areas. And so it creates internally different uh, groups that are infighting. And so in the end, they, 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 the whole company breaks down. So the idea of uh, autopoiesis, a successful autopoiesis is a phenomenon in which the system preserves itself, it, it improves, it grows, or at least it keeps its uh, being uh, even if the environment changes. And a pathological one is one that cannot resist to, to either external or internal challenges. Uh, uh, for instance, an Autopoietic system is a healthy uh, body, while if it gets cancer or something or another or an infection or so, it might break down. So nothing ensures that autopoietic systems will resist every possible aggression from outside or inside. But uh, the more the, the healthy ones are the ones that are able to, to, to survive. Just as a follow-up, uh, Andres asked, how would surplus, in quotes, be reconciled in this if it requires it? Or could you clarify that? And Jason Ross says, thank you. Surplus? Uh, you mean economic surplus? Well, it just says, how would surplus be reconciled in this if it requires it? Maybe Andres can, uh, can clarify that as you go through your other questions. I'll come back to you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, surplus, in, in the economic sense, surplus 
is something that can be uh, used by the by the an autopoietic system to enlarge itself, to grow. It's something that actually, if you have a company, a small company that has a large profit uh, and uh, it can use it to invest in new activities, but still keeping its being a single company, it's an example in which surplus of any sort can be used. Uh, Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I could, would, would add that, that if, if I understand the question right, I, I, I think it's, the, it, it's a good insight to note that these kinds of processes require, um, at least in terms of their physical substrate, what would be called an open system. In other words, autopoiesis depends upon some influx of energy from somewhere. And it might be because, you know, it might be food, it might be the sun, um, but this is, you know, one of the things that uh, mod changed physics in the 19th and 20th centuries was the, the study of open systems as opposed to closed systems. So instead of just taking an initial a set of initial conditions, some, um, you know, some differential equations and watching the system unfold, new things can happen if a system is closed, but has a constant influx of energy. And so in, in that sense, I, autopoiesis does depend upon a surplus, right? It depends upon an environment that feeds energy into the system. And this I think is a, you know, a very interesting line of possible research to think about connections between Luan and people like Bataille, you know, to think of the, the role of excess and surplus um, as productive of, um, uh, of society, so that society is not simply a conservative process or a process based in survival, but is the product of a kind of expenditure, of, you know, a kind of needless expenditure of surplus energy, right? Autopoiesis doesn't need to be there, right? Autopoiesis is always, um, in some sense, uh, an excrescence of its environment, right? It is never, the, the, the environment doesn't need the system, while the system always needs the environment. An interesting uh, mention here in the in the comments is the use of the word negentropy. Um, actually, a completely closed system, according to the second law of thermodynamics, will fall fall apart because entropy will grow continu continuously. But uh, an open system and a system that interacts with the with the ex external world can keep uh, its entropy at bay thanks to the influx of energy from outside it's interesting that uh, the this theory by Carl Friston the active inference brain is also called the, the he he uses what is called the, the free energy principle that a system like the brain tries to maximize its free energy, that the energy that minimize actually in the sense that it tries to use efficiently the resources to do what it intends to do. So this is only possible thanks to being open to the external world. And the interaction with the external world brings, allows the system to get energy from outside and uh, throw the tritus and, 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 and stuff that it doesn't work anymore outside. So, yeah, so there was something else, right? I mean, uh, well, I'm thinking we maybe have time for one more question and I, I just saw there's a question by Mark Lovsky. He asked, which branch of mathematics would be most important to be comfortable with to explore cybernetics more fully? It's that theory. Um, and that's, you know, one of the things that we're going to do in the seminar is look at some uh, elementary category theory. 
as maybe the, the appropriate setting for modeling autopoiesis. But yeah, maybe if you wouldn't mind taking this one, Fernando, what, what do you think, what is it about category theory that makes it the appropriate mathematical framework for dealing with this phenomenon? Mm -hmm. the, the, the thing is that um, set theory is concerned with um, the idea that the important mathematical uh, notion is that of a thing. While in category theory, the important things are relations. So the focus of, uh, of category theory is what is called morphisms of any level, can be morphism, functors, natural transformation, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea is that we can see things as black boxes, but we focus on their interaction. And that interaction is the point in, uh, around which we will see systems. Systems in which we have many components, we will not go into what those components are, but we can focus on their relations. An example is a society. We, don't, we can understand the society without having to understand how each individual in the society thinks or behaves. It's just their interaction, their relations that matter. In the brain or a neural network, we don't care so much about each neuron. We care only about the synapses, the, the, the connections among them. So the mathematical uh, better way to uh, study structures is categorical in the sense that the, the, the focus is on the interactions, not so much in the, uh, in the entities. Although it can be also used to you know, zoom in each component and then see properties that also arise from interactions among them. The idea is to abstract away from details, from you know, superficial or uh, you know, uh, confusing details. Uh, mathematically, category theory was introduced to, to put clear in, 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 a, in a clear way that there are several mathematical areas that are talking about the same thing, but with a quite different language. So category theory abstracts away from those details and cares about the, detail, about the interactions. So there was one last question, I think. Um, uh, Haitam Ibrahim says, what is the relation between the autopoietic system and the environment? If the autopoietic system is self-producing, how does the environment participate in the production of the system? Well, I think that that's something we, we mentioned before that the system provides the inputs and is also a, 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 a place where the, 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 the system can uh, discharge unused or or or, um, or its entropy there, um, and it brings in from this from the environment the energy it needs to reconfigure itself and keep living. Yeah, and I I would just add to that that I think this is one of the. Uh, the most interesting and also challenging aspects of autopoietic systems theory. Um, the, it's the notion that an autopoietic system is operationally closed. So is in fact closed in on itself, but that that closure is the condition of possibility for a kind of radical openness to the environment. And, I, and so there, there's a shift in language from cause or input rather than the environment giving, providing an input to the system. Technically, the system only operates on itself. It only circulates through itself. 
but the environment can perturb the internal equilibrium of the system. And I think this is well captured if you think about the relationship between your mind and your nervous system. When you feel pain, it's actually a mistake to say, I feel my neurons experiencing pain. It's true that your experience of pain is conditioned on certain neural firings, but what you feel is pain. It's internal to a psychic system, which is a distinct system from the system of neurons. Mm. And this is, this is, I think, captures what is, what is very intriguing and difficult about autopoietic systems is that they, they form a, a collection of operationally closed autonomous environments that are of a different ontological order than the environment, even as they're completely conditioned by the environment. Right. And that's why it's, I think that autopoiesis is a completely different way to address the problem of emergence. Rather than the emergence of a new thing, you have a process that is defined solely in terms of its own self-processing. Yeah. And from the standpoint of the environment, nothing, it doesn't exist at all. It's not that there's a new thing in the environment. It's that there is a... Um, sequence of operations that from the standpoint of that sequence itself can be understood as a thing, mm -hmm. um, right? Only society recognizes itself as society. Mm -hmm. The environment doesn't, doesn't see society, right? The world doesn't see minds. Um, and so it, I think it, there's a, a, a deep, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a different metaphysics than the one that we're familiar with. There is a term in, in, in the theory of, the physical theory of systems that is used here. This is very interesting to, to apply here. And it's a Markov blanket. A Markov blanket is kind of a, the, the, the surface of the system inside of which the system exists and, and creates itself and uh, outside it is the, the, the external world. Uh, the Markov blanket is in charge of this input of energy and, uh, and uh, release of uh, entropy and so on. But the system, the autopoietic process is carried out inside the Markov blanket. And um, it comes to my mind a, a, a story by, by the uh, Polish uh, science fiction writer Stanislav Lem, who has this uh, it's a kind of a joke, but uh, you have a, you, uh, a sp space, uh, um, you know, place where, where, where old satellite, satellites live, uh, trash of every kind there, but at some point, some part of that trash connects itself and creates an intelligence. And it lives there, thinks a lot, and uh, creates a metaphysics, a view of the universe. And then because of the orbital, uh, uh, orbital mm, decay of this, the uh, cloud of debris, it falls apart. But nobody recognized that there was an intelligence there at all. It was close to itself and the environment was not able to recognize that. And that's a possibility. I, 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 I think that uh, the, the, the recognition of an external autopoietic system is also part of a larger autopoietical system. So it allows us to talk about hierarchies of hierarchies of hierarchies. Uh, so this view is very, very rich and gives us a lot of possibilities to understand the physical, the, the, the biological, the, 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 the human world. And, uh, and I think that it will be very exciting to, to talk about this in more detail in, in the next month. And with that, we'd love to 
thank our, our guest speakers today. Thank you so much, Rocco Gengo and Fernando Tome. And we look forward to your, your seminar. Uh, for those of you watching, uh, click on the link uh, to the seminar below and uh, sign up. You can also subscribe for 10, 10 bucks or 10 euros a month and uh, take the seminar that way too. So thank you all and uh, for being part of, uh, for being part of GCAS. And I wish you all the best. And I say good night from London. Good night, Rocco and uh, Fernando. Take care. Thanks a lot. Hey, thanks, thanks a lot. You. Thanks everyone for, for joining. Thank you. And let's see.